Okay, folks, so in this video, I'm going to discuss the first time that I've given, which is on ecology. So this is an introduction to ecology and what the terms mean. This video is especially for those who haven't been able to make the Google Hangout classes. So first of all, let's start off with opening definition. And there's going to be a lot of definitions and scientific terms that you need to learn in this topic. Very important. Something a lot of you haven't been putting the effort in, and it's where you're losing marks. Okay, so... The definition of ecology is the study of the interaction between groups and their of organisms and their environment. Okay, so an organism is defined as living any living thing. This includes plants, animals, bacteria, and fungi. All right. So sometimes people get in their head that organisms just means animals and things that move. No, plants as well, as I said, as well as bacteria and fungi in the soil and in the air and in the water. In the study of ecology, scientists try to understand the relationship between different living things in the natural world. That's what an ecologist does. So in order to study this, they must identify different factors of the family. Okay, so the first thing we want to look at is the place where an organism lives. Okay, so the place where an organism lives is called its habitat. And examples of habitats would be things like a pond, a meadow, the hedges between fields, a woodland, you know, anything like that. Okay. Within the habitats, there are various groups of organisms that live in it, okay? So there can be plants, animals, or microorganisms, your bacteria and your fungi, okay? So we talk about in a specific, an organism, when we talk about like this is a specific individual thing. So when you, you know, it wouldn't be birds. It would be sparrows, thrushes, robins, okay? It wouldn't be insects. It would be um, ant, honeybee, wasp, so forth, okay? So... The scientific term for a group of the same organism living in a habitat is called its population. So if we talk about the population of foxes in an area, we're talking about that we're using the correct scientific term for the all of the foxes in a habitat, okay? The habitat itself is made up of all the different populations of organisms that live in and make it up. Let's spot a typo there. So the scientific term for all the different populations that live in a habitat is called a community. So the community of a habitat is the population of foxes and hedgehogs and sparrows and grasshoppers and bacteria and fungi and so on and so forth. So that's what we mean by the community. Okay, now these are all terms that I said that we have to learn off and how to use properly. So if you look at the example of a pond, a freshwater pond, it would be made up of a population of frogs, dragonfly, reeds. They're the tall like grass like thingies okay that you might see sometimes around the canal and a few other places okay and algae that's the green slimy stuff that grows in the water that make up the community within the pond okay so we're now getting into another definition which is an ecosystem so an ecosystem consists of all the communities of organisms and their interactions with the environment this is very important okay this interactions okay it's very important to remember that okay interactions with the environment so an ecosystem that covers a very large area is called a biome, all right? So examples of biomes would be things like deserts, rainforest jungles, coral reef systems, amongst others. And all the various ecosystems together form uh, 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 one large ecosystem, got a lot of typos in this, called a biosphere. So biospheres extend from the bottom of the oceans to the tops of the highest mountains. Now, within an ecosystem, we have to look at the different factors that affect that ecosystem. And basically, there's two types of factors that affect an ecosystem. The first is biotic factors. These are living factors, and they are the influence of one organism on another organism within your ecosystem. And then you have abiotic factors, and these are non-living factors which influence organisms in an ecosystem. So we have first examples of biotic factors. So the first is competition. So the struggle between organisms for resources that are in short supply, such as food, light, shelter, mates for reproduction, okay? Now, competition can be occurring between two organisms of the same type. So, say, two male birds of a particular type trying to get a mate, okay? Or it could be between two organisms of a different type, a sparrow and a hawk that are both competing to get um, space in trees to build nests. Okay, so don't forget that, okay? Now, um, predation is the next one. Predation is the correct term for the hunting of different organisms. So a fox hunts a rabbit, the fox is the predator, the rabbit is the prey, and the process of the hunting is called predation. 
Disease. Well, that's fairly self-explanatory because disease spreading from one organism to another, just at the moment with this pandemic we're in, which can affect um, so many or all organisms in an ecosystem. And then you got decomposition. So decomposition is the natural breakdown of a dead organism. So when an organism, be it a plant or animal, dies, what happens to it? Well, what happens to it is bacteria and fungi start growing on the dead organism, feeding off of its body. Um, whether that was an animal or a plant is irrelevant, uh, and that caused it to break down, and the nutrients that made up that organism eventually make their way back into the soil through this process of decomposition. So now we get on to our abiotic factors. So remember, I just said abiotic means non-living. So examples of abiotic factors would be wind. Plants will grow differently in a windy area to a non-windy area. Altitude. So that's the height of your ecosystem, as in the physical height. Is it really high up in the mountains? Or is it low down close to sea level? Why is this a factor? Because the higher up you are in altitude, the colder it will be. The top of a mountain is always colder than the bottom of a mountain. Okay? And then we get into aspect. Okay? So aspect is the direction your ecosystem faces. And by direction, I mean north, south, east, or west. Okay? Why this is relevant is because an ecosystem that faces in a southerly direction, say a hill or a slope, will get more sunlight because of the way the sun travels across the sky. Now, this is in the Northern Hemisphere. If we're in the Southern Hemisphere, it's flipped, and a northerly-facing um, ecosystem gets more sunlight, okay? But this, the sun rises in the east, is at its highest point in the south, and then it sets in the west, okay? So um, this is why the more southerly-facing a uh, spot is, the more sunlight it gets, direct sunlight it gets over the day, which will make it easier for plants to grow, which means that the ecosystem, the area itself, is generally warmer and that impacts on what organisms are going to be able to live and thrive in that area. Okay, so now we're going to talk about organisms themselves. Okay, so organisms in ecology can be divided into different groups depending on how they get their food. The first type of organism, and by first we mean at the bottom of the food chain and the really important ones, okay, are the producers. And these are organisms that make their own food. What organisms make their own food? Plants, okay, green plants, photosynthesize, okay. Photosynthesis is the making of food by a plant by absorbing energy from the sun and using that energy to make sugar molecules, which are its food. Okay, certain types of plants, um, certain types of bacteria that grow in in seas and in water as well, um, they are the things that make their own food. No animals can photosynthesize. Okay, now you have your consumers. So these are organisms that get their food by eating another organism. So, animals are all consumers, okay? Now, before anybody asks me about Venus flytraps, a Venus flytrap and similar carnivorous plants don't actually get food from the animals that they eat. What they get is nutrients from those animals. And those are plants that have evolved as carnivorous plants grow in soil that's got really poor nutrients and minerals in it. So, they're still making their own food by photosynthesis, but when they eat a fly or something, it's to get the protein and the minerals and the and those nutrients from it to help it grow, not the food, okay? But anyway, so your consumers are your animals, okay? So all animals survive by eating another organism. First, you have the herbivores, things like cows, sheep, the likes, okay? That only eat plants, okay? Which themselves get their food from, from photosynthesis from the sun. Then you've got the carnivores, which only eat meat of animals. All right, so you have a sheep, which is going to eat a blade of grass. And actually, no, that's a bad example. Uh, a rabbit eats a blade of grass. Uh, that's what it lives off is grass and plants. And then a fox eats a rabbit, okay? Although foxes can eat other stuff, okay? Let's say a cat. Yeah, uh, a cat eats the rabbit, okay? Because then you have your omnivores, which can eat both plants and animals. And that's why the fox example I just gave is bad because the fox is actually an omnivore. Foxes eat lots of meat, but they can also survive off things like berries and the likes, okay? Humans are omnivores. We eat plants, but we also eat animals, okay? Some animals are strict carnivores. So cats, for example, are strict carnivores. They can't break down and process meat. Uh, or sorry, if, uh, plants. If a cat starts eating things like grass and the likes, it's usually because it has an upset stomach and it's trying to help its digestive system. Dogs, on the other hand, they're 
predominantly carnivores, but they can get some nutrition from eating plants, okay? And then you've got, but strict omnivores are things like um, primates, for example, like humans, okay? And there are a lot of uh, bears. Actually, a bear is, a, is an omnivore. They eat meat, but they also like to eat berries and honey and stuff like that as well, okay? Now, the last type of organism in this process is the decomposers. So decomposers are organisms which feed on dead and decaying plants and animals. And examples of this would be bacteria and fungi in the soil, which break down the food, or break down dead uh, organisms. So within an ecosystem, the plants depend, the animals depend on the plants for oxygen, and some will also depend on the plants for food. Many plants also depend on animals for pollination, which is uh, to um, how they reproduce, um, and also to spread their seeds and fruit. Without the help of these pollinators, many plants would be unable to reproduce. And that's a big thing. Like we're talking about the bees that are um, going extinct. This is a massive problem. If bees and other pollinators were to suddenly all die out, 15%, I think, of all the food that we eat would be gone because all those plants would not be able to reproduce. Now, plants do compete with each other, but the things they compete with each other for are water, sunlight, and space in which to grow, okay? So in a forest, for example, um, the different types of plants are trying to get above the other ones to get more sunlight. Animals compete with each other for food, shelter or space to live in, and also for mates, uh, for uh, reproduction. Next, we have our microorganisms, such as bacteria and fungi, which live off dead and decaying plants and animals, breaking them down. So without our decomposers, an ecosystem, not a typo, would be filled with dead plants and animals, and then the soil would become barren because the nutrients needed would have been taken out by all the plants and not recycled back in. So the decomposers are really important because they put the nutrients back in the soil, which allows the plants to continue to live, which therefore provides food to the herbivores and then to the carnivores and omnivores so the cycle can continue, okay? So there we go. There is my basic introduction to ecology in brief. Um, there's a number of questions at the end of this document, which I've shared on Google Classroom. So go over this, take your time, read the questions carefully, answer them all, and then you can submit it to me for correction, okay? So thanks, everybody. Um, keep up the good work, and remember to wash your hands.